Hello, I'm Robin, and welcome to Bookspin. Last night, I had the pleasure of speaking with Victor Manibo, a New York-based writer and immigration lawyer whose debut novel, The Sleepless, came out last year. This is one of the most memorable books that I've read in recent times. And here it is. It's essentially a science fiction noir thriller, and it's set in a near future world in which a pandemic of sleeplessness has swept across the globe. So anyone who gets this mysterious new disease permanently loses the ability to sleep. And I think it's a really intriguing premise. On top of that, it's a very well-written and thought-provoking thriller. So I can definitely recommend it. Um, in fact, I made a review video it was one of the first videos that I made for this channel last year, so I'll put a link to that down below. Okay, so I'm here today with Victor Manibo, um, who is my first guest ever on this channel, so welcome. Hi, I'm so <laughs> happy to be the first. Thanks thank for having you. me. No, thank you for sparing some time for us. Um, last year, I read The Sleepless, which is your debut novel, which got published last year. So congratulations on that. Thank you. Um, I really enjoyed reading it. And I hope more people can discover it because I think it's a wonderfully crafted sci-fi mystery. And the whole concept, the whole premise of the novel is really fascinating. So my first question is, how is the whole debut author experience been for you? Well, it's been great. Like, I feel that I had the the full experience that I envisioned in my head uh, going into this process. I had always wanted to become an author since a young age. It's not something I seriously pursued until, you know, in the past four years. And I always imagined that it would uh, be well received by my friends and family, first of all, because they're really kind of my main audience. I, I wish that I could produce something that I could be proud to show my friends and family, and they received it well. Um, and then it's also, you know, gratifying that the general public, uh, the people who are in the science fiction, fantasy, and horror community, they've all uh, received it positively and have had nice words to say about it. And thank you also for the kind words that you said. Uh, and uh, yeah, I, I did the book tour. I did uh, a small tour of like a few cities. I was able to do um, the National Book Festival here in Washington, DC. I did uh, the World Science Fiction Convention in Chicago. And experiencing all of that just as a fan of speculative fiction is, is wonderful in and of itself. But being able to do that as an author and as an author who's um, debuting is even like ex more exponentially mind blowing. Um, I have uh, zero complaints. And also I got to um, do my uh, book launch at The Strand here in New York City, which is one of my favorite places in the world and my favorite bookstore. So that was just uh, kind of a, in my bucket list. So, so yeah, it's been a great six months so far since the book debuted. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask you about your sort of relationship with speculative fiction um, and science fiction in general. and. Have you always been much of a, a reader of science fiction? I I was a young reader um, of mystery. That was my first entry into reading stories and and novels. Um, so we're talking Sherlock Holmes, we're talking Agatha Christie. I was probably reading them when I was too young to be reading them. Uh, but that's what spurred my love of of literature. I think the science fiction part of me got activated when I started reading 
comic books and when I started watching uh, the X-Men animated series back in the 90s. I don't know how old you are or uh, if you <laughs> if you caught that TV series, but it really imprinted in me. And I'm like, okay, I, I want more of these stories. I want more stories about um, people with superpowers. I want more stories um, where they go to space and, and fight, uh, you know, dastardly aliens and, uh, you know, alien civilizations. Um, so, so that's the entry point into sci-fi um, speculative fiction. Um, then it was um, cyberpunk, as you probably can tell from um, The Sleepless, uh, which is very heavily influenced by um, cyberpunk works. And and that's that's really where it grew out of. I think when I look back on The Sleepless, it does have those two strains of what got me into sci-fi, which are human beings with very complex um, backgrounds and traumas, and then having some sort of um, ability, a, a special ability that sets them apart. And also with the cyberpunk noir um, strain of, of, of my um, sci-fi nerdery DNA, um, you can see the world building in Sleepless um, is all about that. You have, you know, the, the, the criminal underground, you have the evil corporations, you have all the conventions that are um, part of cyberpunk as a subgenre of sci-fi. Yeah, I, I think that's, that's really interesting. One thing I really liked about the sleepless is the kind of blending of genres. So you've, you've mentioned some mystery thrillers and yes. um, I think it's essentially, it is a, a crime mystery thriller, but it's set in a kind of science fictional world, um, a kind of near future world. And there, there are some, perhaps some dystopian elements there. Where did you come up with the idea of the sleepless to, to start with? I came up with it in 2017, fall of 2017. I was coming from a very busy weekend um, with my parents in Jersey. And, you know, a weekend with the parents, sometimes it just like gets away from you. And next thing you know, it's Sunday night. You having the Sunday scaries. You're looking at the week ahead and you're thinking, wow, my to-do list is a mile long. I didn't get any rest. I didn't get anything done over the weekend. I wish I just didn't have to sleep. Um, and, and I was like, oh, you know what? That's That's kind of a cool thought experiment. I wasn't even thinking that I would write that. It was more like, well, let's think about that. Like if I didn't have to sleep, what, what would my body look like? Um, what would my mind um, process or what can it not process and process um, on account of always being turned on? Um, and then the thought experiment kind of expanded into thinking about, oh, what if everyone was like this? What would their world look like? And I think as I asked more and more questions that led to more questions, I got the desire to like write it down and see uh, what what is the natural endpoint of all of these questions and how that kind of fits in into the world that we live in and the way I live my life as an adult with competing demands on my time and attention. And so it was like, okay, well, this sounds like a really interesting premise. Uh, maybe, maybe I can write this into a novel. And I challenged myself myself to to draft a novel. And and then the next thing you know, I finished it. And and then I was like, what's next? Okay, let's let's see if we can if we can get this out in the world. Okay, yeah, that, that's interesting. Did you always know that you wanted to be a novelist? Because I think you correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you were. Um, you're a lawyer, yes, an, an, yes. an immigration lawyer. Did you always know that you wanted to be a writer? Uh, I've always loved books, and I've always, in the back of my mind, thought maybe someday I'll write a book. Um, and when the idea of The Sleepless came to me, it was at a point in my life where I was kind of equipped with enough, I guess you would say, ideas and human experience to have something to say in a novel. Um, and also I had some, you know, time, I guess, even though I was complaining about not having enough time, but I had some time where I can pursue a hobby. 
And so I guess I've always wanted to to do it. I always thought that at some point in my life I would do it. Uh, but when it happened, it was more like haphazard. It wasn't planned that like, okay, now begins the novelist part of my life. It wasn't like yeah. that at all. But you hit upon this idea of uh, a sleepless pandemic, which I think in, in the book you use the term hyperinsomnia, mm-hmm. right? And, and I think you, you mentioned sort of, you know, how you might have come up with this idea. And I, th- I think it's a really great idea, but now in the book, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, I try not to reveal too many plot details. I'm not going to release any spoilers or anything, but it's it's kind of suggested it t- towards the start of the book that uh, this is a pandemic, but it's kind of like a disease where people lose the ability to sleep, but there are no real side effects, no uh, apparent side effects to your health. And the um, the reactions among the public are quite mixed. Some people fear it, some people, uh, there's a lot of prejudice against the sleepless, and some people are more accepting of it, and then some people actually want to become sleepless themselves. They see it's desirable. So I guess my question is, what's your attitude to this? Would would you want to be sleepless <laughs> yourself? If, if there was no really no side effects to your health, would it is it something that would benefit the individual uh, or society even. <laughs> I, I I think when I started writing the book, I was playing with this idea of if this is a thing that happens, everyone will have a different reaction to it because everyone has a different relationship with sleep as an activity. They have a different relationship with the concept of productivity, which the book deals with a lot. Right. And and with the concept of who is hardworking and who is not, who is lazy and who is not, what is the best use of our time? And everyone will have a different answer to that. And so I wanted to show a world where there are those different factions who have different relationships to the uh, hyper insomnia pandemic. Um, that's why I set the book, I think, 10 years into the pandemic, because at that point, it's more that the, the pandemic is more understood. Everybody knows um, what the rules are of hyper insomnia, right? I think initially, if you had come to me and said, okay, now there's a sleepless pandemic, do you want it or not? What do you feel about it? Initially, I'd be like, hell no, I don't know what this is. I don't know what's going to happen to me. Um, and that's that scary. The unknown is scary. And I wanted to jump past that and get to the point where like, okay, these are the ground rules. What do you think? This is the deal. Are you going to take it or not? Um, and now if you ask me that question, I would say, <laughs> honestly, I would probably say yes. Um, oh, really? It, okay. It, it, I mean, it, it, yeah. it's ironic because ever since I really took being an author seriously and having a career seriously, I've had more demands on my time, all of which I think are valuable and important and that I want to pursue. So I I feel like, oh yes, I I do right now (laughs) wish I had more time even before like um, uh, when I came up with the idea. And, And so part of me is like, yes, yes, this would be perfect. But again, the someone who says yes to hyper insomnia as our main character jamie does in the book uh we'll find that there is a a drawback to that even though this the rules as the world knows it is there are no physical side effects there are no uh, mental side effects Uh, there is still a toll that it takes on your relationship with time and if you had infinite time, do you value it more? Or do you value it less? So I think that's that's one thing that um, I wanted to explore, and and that's probably one thing that um, I might come to regret, even though right now I'm saying yes to it. Um, and you know, with and we do want to avoid spoilers. There are other complications that will come with with being sleepless. Um, but depending on the day, I I would say. Yes, it's worth it. It's fine. I'm okay with it. Um, and then some days I'm like, no, um, you know what? Uh, life is life is good as it is. We do need sleep, and and 
whatever demands are on me, I can probably say no if I wanted to. Um, so it really depends. Right now, if you say, if you ask me, like, yeah, sure, let's do it. Like, why not? It's a new way of living. I want to try it out. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, from my point of view, I think I am someone who really enjoys sleeping. I think it's one of the yeah. the, the pleasures of life. And right. <laughs> um, I can't imagine giving it up. But at the same time, I can totally understand the desire to have more time because that's a, a, something that a lot of people can relate to. And I think if I if, if we could have a, a form of sleeplessness where you could switch it on and off. Yeah. So, so let, let's say um, I don't go to sleep this week because I've got some big project I want to work right. on or, yeah, I just want to do lots of reading or whatever. Or if I, you know, if I could reduce the amount of sleep I need, if I could have some control over it, but I don't want to give it up totally, that would, I could probably accept that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's that the ideal, right? Yeah. You know, you can pick and choose the best parts of it. Um, I, I think if if that were the case, then I would be 100%, yes, yes, I want yeah. to do it. Um, yeah, so you've, you've mentioned the protagonist, uh, Jamie, who I, I think is quite an interesting character. It's a queer Filipino character. Mm -hmm living in New York and I think it's it's quite refreshing to see some Asian representation and some queer representation in a POV character because it's not something you see that much in in sci-fi or at least the kind of books that I've read um although it is becoming more of a diverse field right so but I'm wondering how much of yourself did you place in in that character it's it's really interesting that you mentioned uh, placing a, a, a Filipino and a queer character in the POV because you're right you don't really see it a lot in sci-fi and although it's getting better you know I was talking about cyberpunk earlier as an influence and cyberpunk is very in influenced by Asian aesthetics and you never really at least in the major works that people think about you never really see the an Asian character in the center as a planetary character. Um, and I felt like that was important to me um, to bring that out into the work that I was producing. And and as you were saying, he Jamie, our main character, is queer. He's Filipino. He lives in New York. I am the same. I am queer. I am Filipino. I live in New York. Because this was my first novel, and everybody says, write what you know, I wrote what I know. Uh, and also, it was important to me to, again, have those characters in the center stage of a science fiction novel. But as to the question of how much is um, in Jamie um, of, of Victor, I, I would say, wow, I would say maybe 40, 30 percent, only okay. because I, I feel like Jamie, when I look at Jamie, when I read Jamie and think about the decisions he's made, I'm always thinking like, man you you you're a little bit of an idiot you know that right <laughs> like he he i think um uh, for better or worse and and um he takes risks that to my mind are risks i would not take they're kind of uncalculated risks or miscalculated risks uh, there are parts where he is indecisive and he's pressed into decisions by circumstances where i would be like you know what just just do it just just go for it or like just do the thing that needs doing as opposed to um you know being tortured by it obviously he's tortured by certain decisions in his life because of certain things that have happened to him yeah. but to me i'm I, I, sometimes i look at it as wow you you're you're stuck and you need something to snap you out of it and the way you deal with that is not the healthiest um so so yeah, that's that's what I feel about it. I love this character. I think there's a lot of um, layers to him, and, and you know that sounds like I'm, I'm tooting my own horn because I created this character. But um, he is a very flawed character uh, as well, and um, frustrating to me sometimes looking at him from like an outsider. No, I I agree. I think he is quite a complex character. Um... What about the, the other characters? Are any of the characters kind of modeled on 
people you know or did they were they just kind of did you build them from the ground up to kind of fit the story you wanted to tell i think for most of those characters there they were um i started out with archetypes i was i knew i was writing something in the cyberpunk sci-fi noir field and i knew i was writing a mystery and those genres come with archetypal characters that I felt um, if I wanted to honor these genres, I had to have those characters. But of course, when we're talking about archetypes, they're mostly the scaffolding onto which you build something more. So so that's what I did. Um, like you were saying, I, I built them from the ground up, but it's not from whole cloth. These were inspired by the tropes that I know, the tropes that I love, the tropes that I grew up watching or reading. Um, I'm thinking, for example, of the main antagonist. Um, uh, you know, he's very much inspired by, um, you know, what I have seen in, let's say, uh, Blade Runner or the Matrix movies but also inspired by real life because um, when we're talking about um, sci-fi noir or cyberpunk, you're always talking about corporations and capitalism. And we do have those figures in real life who kind of act in villainous ways. <laughs> Sometimes they also look villainous and, and it's hard not to draw inspiration from real life in the world that we live in now. Yeah, I can totally see that. Um... I mean, personally, I think that the characters and the story itself works well on a number of levels. So it's a kind of, it's a thriller. It's an exciting thriller. It's also a kind of whodunit in a sense, because there there is a, um, a death near the start, an apparent suicide, but it's not entirely clear what's going on. Um, but it's also kind of thought provoking drama. In it. I think it, it raises some important philosophical questions, like how do we deal with grief, mm -hmm. um, which is something that Jamie has been suffering from in his life. And yeah. um, the nature of memory um, is quite a, sort of an important theme. Um, but I, I also think that there's, in, in my opinion, a, it's almost like a cinematic element to this. I mean, you've mentioned Blade Runner and The Matrix, but I, I and I think cyberpunk works quite well as a as a visual um, medium. Um, but I think there's, there's a cinematic element to the story, which I think would work well on the screen. So do you think The Sleepless, in your opinion, would it work as a, a movie or a TV a adaptation? I would love for that to happen. <laughs> I think... <laughs> I I love movies and I love TV shows. I, I love all sorts of storytelling. And with The Sleepless, I think um, if, if it were to be adapted into a visual medium, I think it would work better as a series than a movie, although I can also see it as a movie. Um, and, and, and that would be great. That would be the dream. If, if Netflix or Amazon wants to throw money at this project, I, I wouldn't say no. Uh, absolutely yeah yeah i think it would be amazing um so yeah a, a quick question um i love this the cover of this book mm -hmm. I, i've actually um talked about this book cover before in a previous video when i was talking about some of my favorite book covers yeah <laughs> and um were, were you involved in the cover design at all or, or was that all down to the publisher no, that was uh, the folks at Erewhon um, hired this very talented cover designer. Her name is Dana Lee. And, uh, you know, Dana's done amazing covers. Um, and I was so lucky when they showed me this because I was like just blown away. I, I didn't know what I wanted in a cover uh, before I saw this. I just knew it had to. It was like, I know I will. I'll know it if I see it, if I whether or not I like it. I had no concept of what this process would be. So they just gave me some options. I saw this and I was like, yes, that is it. And everybody on the team agreed. Um, I think one of uh, the most common things that I hear about the book is 
you have an amazing cover and I'm like, I wish I could take credit for it. I'm just lucky to be the recipient of that cover. Um, but all credit goes to my publisher, Erwan, and the artist, Daniel Lee. Um, they were great. They uh, they asked for my opinion and I all I said was like, this is amazing. Yes, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, it's an amazing cover. Um, speaking of which, uh, any word on when the paperback is due out? Yeah, the paperback should be due out uh, maybe later this year or early next year. Um, we do want people to enjoy uh, the hardback, especially um, there was a special edition that just came out from Unplugged Boxes. Um, so it, it'll be a little while yet before the paperback comes out, but it is coming soon. Okay, cool. I have noticed on your website that you have another novel which you're working on, mm -hmm. uh, Escape Velocity. Can you tell us anything about that? Uh, sure. My yeah. second book is going to be a sci-fi space thriller mystery. It's kind of in the vein of um, The Sleepless, but it's a standalone, totally separate story, um, and it's about uh, four friends who go to their high school reunion at a luxury space station in lower Earth orbit. One of them gets imperiled, maybe dies, we don't know. And um, the rest of the friends have to kind of scramble and figure out what happened. And in, in the process, secrets come out, um, you know, emotional baggage gets drawn out and, and dealt with. And so you, you kind of have these recurring themes from the sleepless and, and escape velocity of people's past coming back to haunt them. And also this book, kind of like the sleepless, deals with really contemporary social issues. When uh, with the sleepless, I was dealing with capitalism. This one's going to deal more about wealth inequality. Um, you know, we're... we're I'm thinking uh, of pitching this, or at least describing this book as Knives Out, but in space. Um, oh, you've already sold or, me. <laughs> yeah, or White Lotus in space. So um, that is definitely the vibe, and hopefully it will come out spring 2024. Okay. Okay, so we've got a bit of a wait. Oh, yeah, but, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. We, we, we kind of want a little bit of runway. Um, to make this the best book possible, but the the story is set and done. It's more just about uh, you know going through the book production process, which, as you probably know, can take a while. Okay, well, I hope you get um, a similar uh, eye-catching cover for that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you'll look yeah. out for it. I mean, yeah. all of that yeah. is in the works. Um, I think it's officially going to be announced. Um, probably in the next few weeks. So, um, you know, depending on when this show is going to air, uh, the announcement will probably be out. Okay, fantastic. So, uh, for you know anyone who's interested in finding more about you and your work, um, what's the best way to to reach you or to find out about your stuff? Sure, everyone can find me at Victor Manibo. That's just my first name and my last name. And that's on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook. It's all the same handle. It's at Victor Manibo. I also have a website, victormanibo.com. Most, well, not most, all of my events are going to be there. If I have an appearance at a convention or a conference or a, a book event, that's the best way to to know my, my schedule and my calendar. Okay. Well, it's been really fascinating talking to you. So yeah. um, thank you very much. Uh, and I will definitely keep an eye out uh, for Escape Velocity and whatever else you're working on in the meantime. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. This was so much fun. Thank you.